Amen. You may be seated. Welcome to church. So glad you're here. So you and I started a series entitled To the Ends of the Earth. We picked up the book of Acts last week. We, by God's grace, were able to finish up chapter one. And so guess where we are this week? Good guess. Good guess. Yes, good guess. So we are in chapter two. Uh, we're not going to do the entire chapter. We're going to probably two-part this chapter. There's quite a bit of meat on those bones. So by God's grace, we're going to make it at least through halfway of the chapter, chapter two. So we were going we're to be in Acts chapter two, starting in verse one. You recall last week, as you're turning there, we said uh, this book is written. It covers really 35 years of history, right? It's going to cover 35 years after the ascension of Jesus Christ. You and I can sit down and maybe read this book in a couple of minutes. As we're flipping through the 28 chapters in Acts, we're going through 35 years of church history. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Remember what we talked about as well. Luke um, is the author of this book. He is not a pastor. He's a physician. So his flavor of writing is different. His style of writing is different. So we're going to come across that numerous things. Remember what we said, the book of Luke and the book of Acts are eyewitness accounts to be used in court to Caesar. And so there's no negative mention of Rome because when they stand before the judge, they can't speak ill of their country. And so we'll notice that as we move forward. We said last week as well, um, the the tragic end of Judas, which we ended our service with last week, a very graphic ending uh, to his life. So as Judas is gone, Matthias now comes in and takes that place of that 12th disciple. We also said last week, we sometimes forget Jesus did have that 12, but he would also have a group of 120 around him. We said uh, last week, there's that group of 120, and out of that 120, they go to get Judas's replacement. Last week, we also said Acts chapter 1, verse 8. No need to go there. I'll read it to you. Acts 1, 8. But you will receive power. That word again being dynamite. When you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I believe this is on your handout, your very first blank. The Holy Spirit will give power to be witnesses. That's what we said last week. The Holy Spirit will give power to be witnesses. Uh, not to go witness but to be a witness towards other people. The idea is people, the, the followers of Jesus Christ, the disciples are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The idea is the world should look upon us and say, you know, there's something fundamentally different about he or she. There's something different about this young person, this older person, this person who follows Jesus. There's something different, whatever they have, I want. And hopefully that'll be an encounter that we had with the Holy Spirit as well. So the Holy Spirit's going to give us power to be witnesses. If that sounds good, say yes. All right, so we're caught up. Let's get in the text. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. If you're there this morning, say word. word. All right, let's jump in with both feet. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Your attention, please. That is an absolute mouthful. You and I, as Americans, we have certain holidays that we celebrate through the year. Of course, um, we're at the end of August crazy to, to believe. We have Labor Day coming up, but really Labor Day I wouldn't consider a major holiday, although we get the day off, thank God, some of you hopefully. Um, Labor Day is coming up, but then in a couple of months we have Thanksgiving, and that's where really things begin to slow down. We celebrate that in our own various ways. Uh, many will have time with family. You'll celebrate that depending on your culture and tradition. We'll have Christmas coming up in just a couple of months. Before you know, we'll be doing our candlelight service. By the way, we'll announce when that date is coming up very, very soon. Be on the lookout. And then in January, we have New Year's. So you have, as Americans, we have a back-to-back-to-back. -to -back -to -back. Then throughout the year, you're going to have different things. Easter will be a big one in the spring. And then for an American, of course, the granddaddy of them all, 4th of July. And that's going to be one we just recently celebrated. So we have our annual events. We have our annual holidays. To the Jewish people, they do as well. So in the text, when the day of Pentecost came, circle, highlight, underline, Pentecost. Right next to that, right, it's a season. It's a, it's a season of celebration. It's a season of celebration, which they're currently going through right now. Let me explain. So the various different events, different seasons and festivals that the Jewish people had required them to travel to go to the south, to Judea, to Jerusalem, to go celebrate this feast, to go to the temple, to go sacrifice, to go do the things that, in which they needed to do. So the very first one, write this down on your handout, the 14th of Nisan. Everybody see that? 
I'm not talking about your car. The Nissan is going to be the festival in which you're celebrating, right? So shout out to those Nissan drivers. The 14th day of Nissan, right next to it, is Passover. That's going to be when the lamb is slain, which is going to be representative of Jesus being crucified. Your attention, please. Leviticus 23, verse 5 is going to say this. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. On the 15th day of that month, the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins. For seven days you must eat bread made without yeast on the first day, which according to the Jewish people, the first day is Sunday, right? Shabbat is kind of like their Sunday, and Sunday is going to be the first day of the week. They hold a sacred assembly to not do any regular work, according to the Jewish law in Leviticus 23. Jumping over Leviticus 23, verse 15, this will make sense in a second. You'll, you'll get this in a second. From the day after the Sabbath, count off seven full weeks, count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of first fruits to the Lord. So your attention, please. The very first thing they celebrate is Passover. So that's going to be the night that Jesus really is crucified. Passover, if you're brand new to the Bible, is referring to Moses. Moses um, leading the Jewish people out of Egypt, out of slavery. The Jewish people for 400 years are enslaved to Egypt. They're given the instruction, the angel of death will come upon on this Passover. And in order to be spared the wrath of God, they would have to get a lamb. So they bring a lamb home. The babies, the, the children name the lamb. They're going to name the lamb by first name. It becomes their pet. It becomes blue, brutally slaughtered. The blood is spilt and a hyssop branch is dipped in it. And they'll go on the tr threshold of the door and do this sound here, making the very sign of a cross right there. So this will make a sign of the cross. The idea is whoever is marked with that blood Passover, the judgment will pass over their home. The idea is if we are covered with the blood of Jesus, the wrath also passes over us. Amen? So that's going to be a big, big component there. That's what they're going to celebrate. You'll notice on your handout, the 15th of Nisan, which is going to be leaven. The leaven is going to be representative of yeast, of yeast. What does that represent? It represents sin is removed. Sin is removed. So we get to Passover where Jesus is crucified on the cross. He's put in the tomb and there the sin is removed. So he's in the grave. The idea that they remove yeast is that without yeast, the bread doesn't rise. It's going to be representative of pride and sin. We expel the sin. So write that down. 15th of Nisan, the leaven yeast, sin is removed. Sin is removed. So in order for them to celebrate that, during the festival, they eliminate all the yeast from their house, representative of all the sin leaving their house. So far, so good, gang? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. No need to go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Clean out the old leaven, so that you may be, may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. So the, ind the indication is they're celebrating the crucifixion. They're celebrating Jesus being uh, put in the tomb. Now listen to this on your handout. The first day is Sunday, also known as first fruits. First fruits is going to represent, write this down, Jesus raised and the work stops. Write that down. Jesus raised and the work stops. Jesus raised and the work stops. Your attention, please. The Jewish people are celebrating Christ the entire time without ever noticing it, without ever really realizing. What are they doing? They're celebrating the crucifixion. They're celebrating sin being removed. And now they're celebrating the festival of the first fruits. John 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, 50 days after this, we have Pentecost. Pentecost. So penta means 50. So 50 days later, they now have the Feast of Pentecost. You want to write this down in your handout. Pentecost, 50 days later on Sunday, is also known as the Feast of the Harvest. Write that down. Feast of the Harvest. For you Bible students, a lot of them go by uh, the, the Feast of the Weeks of the latter fruit, of the Shavuot. It's going to have different names in it, but the implication is now going to be Pentecost. Why is this important? I'm so glad you asked. When we get to Acts chapter 2, verse 1, that's what they're celebrating. With their 2024 American eyes and ears, we'll miss that detail. They have been celebrating Jesus all along without really noticing that. Sound good? Sound interesting to anybody? 
Change anybody else, anybody's life? Anybody really got stirred by that? Okay, good. Okay, good. Let's go on. We're on the right track. So we currently find ourselves during the Feast of Pentecost. That'll be important for today's study. Getting to verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. It's going to say this. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Your attention, please. Several things there. You know how we do. Pull out your pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara. Where it says, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind, circle, highlight, underline. The key emphasis is that the wind is like, the movement, what's happening, is like the blowing of very strong wind. So what does that tell us? This isn't like weather. This isn't like a gust of wind. This isn't a storm. This isn't a thunderstorm. We know that it comes from heaven. We know that it's supernatural. The idea is they obviously don't have windows in the first century in the Middle East. So as this wind comes into their home, whatever's hanging on the wall, whatever things that they have in their home, the wind will move everything. The wind will adjust. The wind will alter the things inside of their house. The idea, Christian, is that when the Christian receives the Holy Spirit, that wind, that spirit, alters the things in their life. That's the idea. Things in your life get altered on the altar of the Holy Spirit. And so the wind comes gushing in. It's not going to be something from the weather. It's supernatural from heaven. They see it. They feel it. They experience it. Notice this. It's going to say, a violent wind came from heaven, and listen to this, and filled the whole house where they were, what were they doing? Sitting. Your attention, please. Remember last week and I told you things in the book of Acts are descriptive and prescriptive? Remember when I said that? And so I said, hey, if you come to the book of Acts, at some point you might get offended. So if we don't get you this week, we'll get you next week, okay? Ready for this week's moment? Okay, you gave me permission. Let's go. So the Holy Spirit is going to come upon them, but notice what, they were, what were they doing? They were sitting. They weren't falling. There was no outward expression of that. What does this tell us, believer? This tells us, Christian, as they received the Holy Spirit, they were sitting. There was order when they received the Holy Spirit. There's balance to the order of the Holy Spirit. When we think of the movement of the Holy Spirit, when we think about the Holy Spirit moving, I know for some in this room, you get squeamish. You get uncomfortable. For some in this room, you're like, preach on, pastor. Give them the Spirit, right? So we're going to be in various different places on the playing field theologically. I, I have the, the uh, unique privilege of serving at various churches. Uh, I served at a PCA Presbyterian church. I served in an Evangelical Free Church. I was in Assemblies of God Church for a little while. So I feel like I've been around the theological block. I've seen very different expressions and representations and various backgrounds and, and really Christendom, if you can say that. But here's the, the illusion that it gives us. The Spirit falls down and they're sitting. Think about this. If you've ever seen somebody slain in the Spirit publicly, if anyone you've been, if that's your church background, someone's going to pray, that person falls over, right? They're slain in the Spirit. Here's the issue with that. We see this in Scripture twice. Number one, uh, Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be tried. He's going to be asked, are you the Son of God? Are you the one who proclaims to be the Christ? He says, I am, and that person falls back. They fall back, Scripture would say. The second one is where Jesus ascends from the grave. The stone is rolled away. Jesus comes forth out of the grave. And the scripture is going to say the Roman soldiers fell to the ground. All right? Two places where we see that. They both have something in common. What do they have in common? They're in the presence of Jesus. And number two, they're not believers. They're not believers. So a, a, a word of warning, a word of warning, whenever we see that in scripture... It's not a believer that experiences that. It's going to be someone who doesn't know the Lord. So you're coming forward at a church, and maybe that's your church background. We don't quite that, see it that way. When the Holy Spirit moves, it's not quite what we think it is. The Holy Spirit always moves in order. The Holy Spirit, number one, is a gentleman. He comes when he's welcomed. Number two, the Holy Spirit never interrupts himself. That's another point. The Holy Spirit never interrupts himself. I'm going to pick on Eric since I'm seeing him first. So that's not to say we're proclaiming the Bible. The Holy Spirit is using me to now preach the word, to proclaim, to prophesy truth to you, right? Prophecy isn't forthtelling. It's foretelling. It's proclaiming truth, right? And so we're proclaiming truth here in church. Uh, Eric's not going to stand up and say, Pastor, I have a word. Or he's going to start to laugh uncontrollably or run down the, down the aisle or just start to say, I have this extra word from God. Why? Your attention, please. The Holy Spirit doesn't interrupt himself. 
The Holy Spirit always, always works in order. You imagine I end the service, Sean's going to come on the drum kit, and man, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon him. He'll just start doing these crazy solos. He's going to lose control. Your attention, please. Something we're fearful of the Holy Spirit, a reason that it kind of makes us a little scared, the implication a lot of people have is that they lose control, which we don't see that. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, which means when you're filled with the Spirit, you're moving empowered by the Spirit, you're under control. It's not like it's a possession, right? It's not that like that scene from Beetlejuice where they all just stand up and they start singing at the end of the song, right? It's, that's not the implication. The idea is that we're empowered by the Spirit to do a work of the Lord. That's the idea. Makes sense so far? Okay, we'll get there in a second. So that's what's going to come upon them. The mighty one comes upon them. They receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated. It came to rest on each of them. Your attention, please. So now there's a physical representation, like a fire above their head. They're seeing this literally before them. Here's the catch. They're able to see the room of other people with that flame of fire above their head. Can they see theirs? And that's the point. They can't. They can't go like this. They can't see the flame of fire above their head. Every single time that we serve the Lord using gifts of the Spirit, using our spiritual gifts, it's not for us, it's for the Lord. It's to edify the Lord and to edify others. Verse 4, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Your attention, please. All right, so some of you are now starting to break out in in a cold sweat. Well, pastor, where are you going with this? We're going charismatic. Well, let me, let me submit to you this. When the Bible goes there, we go there. Okay, when the Bible goes there, we go there. When it comes to spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit, representations of the Spirit, you're going to have different schools of thought. You're going to have some people that are going to say that doesn't exist, it ceased. You're going to have some that say it continues on, they're continuous. Here's what I challenge you on. Not to be an extreme on either side, but maybe meet in the middle. Let's say you saw somebody who weighed 600 pounds. You're going to see somebody walking 600 pounds right here on Edgewood down the street. We're going to look at this individual. We're not there to judge them, but our heart's going to break for them, and we're going to say, this person really struggles with food, right? And so we want to help them. We want to help encourage them. We're not going to make fun of them. We're not going to judge. We want them to get help before it's too late. So that 600-pound individual, how do we help them? Do we take the food away? No, they'll starve. Do we give more food? No, that makes the problem worse. What do we do? We balance it with nutrition. We balance it with a diet plan. We balance it with an eating plan. We balance it with good habits. So that's the idea. We're going to find that balance here in the middle uh, of that movement of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Your attention, please. Remember, they're all in town for Pentecost. So they're all in town. This is like... Daytona in July, when everybody goes to the races in, 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 uh, in Daytona, they're going to go to the racetrack. They're going to go hit up the Buckies. They're going to go to the restaurants. They're there for that race. The race is over. Boom, they're out of Daytona. That's the idea. They're all in town for this. Verse 8, or excuse me, verse 6. When they heard this sound, a crowd came in bewilderment. Some of your translations say they marveled, which I love that word even better. They marveled because each one heard their own language being spoken. Your attention, please. We're talking about a region in the Middle East in the first century. Those in that room are going to speak Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. The idea is they begin to start speaking languages outside of the region. And so the idea is people are perplexed. They're starting to hear their own language proclaimed to someone who doesn't speak their language, which is interesting because languages come with dialects and accents. And the Hispanic culture, somebody from, the, from Argentina is going to sound different from somebody from Mexico, is going to sound different from somebody from Ecuador, where my family is, which is going to sound totally different from somebody from Spain. It's a different accent. It's a different accent. My mother is from Ecuador. She has her accent. My mother-in-law is from Tennessee, y'all. That means her children are going to be super confused, right? Hola, y'all, right? Two different accents. But it's interesting that they can understand it in their language and also in their accent. They're going to sound like a native. That way you know it's supernatural. Verse 7, verse 7. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? We'll go there in a second. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Your attention, please. You recall, those of you that are newer to the Bible, Peter, when he denied Jesus three times, and there's that young lady, that middle school girl that says, hey, you were with that teacher Jesus. They knew he was with Jesus because Peter had a 
let's say an accent, y'all, right? He had a Galilean accent. For them in the first century, somebody from Galilee is like somebody from the sticks. It's like somebody from the woods. Is anybody here from Okeechobee? Okay. No, did I see a hand? No, okay, good. So that's like a Floridian saying they're from Okeechobee, right? There's implications. They're from Immokalee, right? There's implications. It's like in the woods, they're out in the sticks. That's the same way. They're looking at Peter as some kind of like country hick, right? They're looking at him like, wait a minute, we know your accent, we know where you're from. So here, Luke is going to name off those places. Verse 9, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, excuse me, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia, uh, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, verse 11, here will be key as we move forward, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Your attention, please. What are they doing ultimately? You want to write this down in your handout. They were praising God. They were praising God. They weren't putting on a show. They weren't, they weren't putting on like some tricks so people can come see them. What were they doing? They were praising God. You using your spiritual gifts, the whole purpose is to praise God. It's to bring people to the Lord and for you to serve the Lord. It's never to edify ourselves or to put ourselves on a platform. It's to always exalt and honor Jesus Christ. Your gifts are all about honoring and exalting Jesus Christ. Write this down since we're there. Write this down. All your handout's going to say, the direction of tongues, that's your word, is man to God. Write that down. That'll be important. The direction of tongues, that's the first blank, is man to God. That's your second blank. Well, Roger, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. Um, let's say I'm preaching. Again, Eric, I'm so sorry. I owe you. I'll buy you a Coke after, after church. I owe you. Uh, let's say Eric begins to now stand up and, say, and he begins to speak in tongues and he says, Here's, here's what it is. And let's say somebody else is going to stand up and say, here's what they're saying. And they're going to say, my dear children, today, here's the word of God for you. Here's the truth. The problem with that is according to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, Paul is going to allude that tongues is from man to God. It is never God to man. Does that make sense? It is always man to God. It is never God to man. Make sense? So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. We studied 1 Corinthians about a year ago. Y'all remember when we started that book? So we covered this topic pretty heavily. So it's going to say this, 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but a spirit, he speaks mysteries. So whenever we see that used in New Testament, it's never God to man. It is always man to God. It is prayer to the Lord. It's never like God has a word for you in tongues. Obviously that doesn't matter because you won't understand. So that's what Paul is trying to say there. So he's trying to really bring and clear some confusion to that church in Corinth. Okay, verse 12, verse 12. Amazed and perplexed. You want to underline amazed, perplexed, amazed, perplexed. They asked one another, what does this mean? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Another translation, I believe in the, in the New King James says this, and I like the wording better. They all continued in amazement and greatly perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. So they're basically, there's going to be a crowd that's going to be a perplexed and amazed. There's also going to be another crowd that's going to say, are these people drunk? Are they inebriated? What is these sounds that they're making? They're speaking in different languages. Are they in their own right mind? Okay. So with that being said, on your handout, three responses to the Holy Spirit. So on your handout, it's going to say three responses to the Holy Spirit. Response number one, write this down, amazement. Amazement. They see the movement. They see the Holy Spirit do something. They see the Lord move, and they just stand back, and they say, wow. Number one, I'm not, su I'm not surprised. I'm not impressed. That, well, I'm very impressed, but I'm not surprised. My God is a big, big God. They stand in amazement. You'll see this in the Scripture. They all continued in amazement and great perplexity. They all stood in amazement. They were all amazed at what was happening. What was happening was supernatural. It was not man. It was the Lord, the Holy Spirit upon them, now doing these things. Your attention, please. Some of us, some of us, you would have a story of an amazing story of the Lord moving. Do you recall 
ever. Do you remember the last time you saw God move? Do you, do you know of a time? And I submit to you this, again, it's not what you think. I remember serving young early on as, as a young youth pastor. We had a youth camp, and man, we were just, a lot of issues were happening, and we were praying, Lord, please, Lord, please, Lord, please. I believe it was a radical movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know what's taking place? People are praying. People are worshiping. People were confessing sins. People were becoming believers. People were um, fixing disputes one between another, conflict resolution. Nobody's falling to the ground. It was nothing out of our control, but we saw the Spirit move. Does that make sense? We saw the Spirit move. A great time. I, I contemplated telling you the story. I'll do it anyway. <laughs> so what are you going to say? Um, so several years ago, I, um, before I uh, proposed to my wife, Rachel, I was in a season of life. Lord, every couple years, Lord, do you, uh, uh, where, where would you have me go? Where, where, where is it that I'm going? Uh, I want to make sure to be right in the center of your will. I want to make sure to be obedient. God, are you redirecting me? And that season of my life, early on, it was, I, I strongly contemplated not being in the ministry. And so, Lord, do you want me to be in the ministry? I met this young lady, Rachel. I'm going to propose. She doesn't know it yet. There were other things taking place in my life. And so I decided to fast and pray. And I just said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to hear from you. I'm going to eliminate distractions. Those of you that have ever fasted and prayed, um, it's an unusual experience in the sense of, yeah, intimacy with the Lord. The hunger pains go away after a couple of hours. Your body just stops asking for food. And then you begin to realize you become sensitive to certain things. And towards the end of your fast, I believe that's where the enemy attacks you the most. That's where I really feel spiritual um, Warfare really intensifies. So I finished this fast, and I remember just feeling down in the dumps, feeling very discouraged. Lord, do you see me? Do you notice me? Lord, am I on the right track? Are you pleased with me? And I'm just dumpy all day, or the entire day. Woe is me in my seat. At this time, I was working as a youth pastor and also working at Campus Crusade for Christ in Orlando, which is now known as Crew. So I worked there on staff. I could tell you exactly where I was in the building. I get up from my desk, and I'm like, you know, I need to go for a walk. I walk. I go to the cafeteria area. I get a cup of coffee. And again, just my whole, my brain, God, do you see me? Do you notice me? Are you pleased? A lady by the name of Diane. I only know her because I met her that day. I don't really know her. I saw her in passing. I've seen her in a couple meetings, but she doesn't know me very well. I'm getting the cup of coffee. She looks at me, and she says, you know, I don't want to sound weird. And I, whenever, when somebody opens up with that, you're just thinking, where, where is this going? I don't want to sound weird. You're thinking, oh boy, where is this going? And so Diane's old enough to be my mom, really. She's an older lady, and she says to me, hey, um, Roger, I felt really strongly, like I felt like, like this inclination to tell you, God sees you, and he's really pleased with you. And I looked at her, and I said, what'd you just say? She's like, yeah, I just felt like I, I felt like I was at my desk, and the Lord so, like really pressed on me, the Holy Spirit pressed on me to tell you, the Lord sees you, and he's pleased with you. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, um, the older I get, the more sappy I'm becoming. Like, I'm watching these, these uh, Thanksgiving commercials with the salt and pepper with the pilgrims is going to come on TV. I'll probably tear up. I just, uh, the older I get, the sappier I'm getting. And that's just what's happening in my life. Um, I excuse myself. I remember going to the bathroom and I wept. And I wept. The Lord met me there. Now think about this. The Holy Spirit knocked on her heart saying, hey, go tell this guy I'm pleased with him. I see him. I notice him. I'm happy with you. And here's the thing. Is it awkward? Yes. Is it uncomfortable? Oh, you bet. But here, I don't know about you. When the Holy Spirit knocks on the heart of your door, that's how the Holy Spirit moves. It's not going to be like, I'm going to do anything weird. I'm going to be like, lose control. No, no. You'll know the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Go say this. Go do this. Go give this. Go here. You ever felt that? That prompting of the Holy Spirit in your heart? You knew it was the Lord. I don't know about you. I'd rather face a couple of seconds, uh, uh, seconds of awkwardness, whether or not they'll receive it, than the days and hours that are going to follow me for not doing it. And I'm kicking myself, thinking, why did I not do that? Why did I not move? Why did I not pick up the phone? Why did I not send that text? Why did I not enter in? And so the idea is that people stand in amazement. Folks, Jesus wants to use you as his hands and feet. The Holy Spirit will knock on the heart of your, the door of your heart. He will use you to be his hands and feet. Be obedient to it. Be open to it. Because what happens? What happens to that lady who had never told me that? I miss out on the blessing. And I also submit to you, she misses out on the blessing. She misses out on the blessing. Amen? Amen? Okay. So number one, they're amazed. Number two, write this down. Perplexity. Perplexity. 
So they see the Holy Spirit. The one crowd's going to be amazed. The second one is going to be perplexed. Perplexity. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? Your attention, please. There's going to be a crowd that's going to say, I don't quite understand this. I don't really know this too much. I don't really know what's happening. Write this down. Our third response, mocking. Mocking. They're mocking. They all continued with amazement. And then Scripture's going to say, but others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. In other words, there was, that, there was that crowd that were mocking the Holy Spirit and saying, they must be inebriated. They must be drunk, right? So we're going to fall in one of those three categories. We're going to be amazed. We're going to be perplexed. We're not going to quite understand. Or number three, it's going to be mocking. Again, your attention, please. When we talk about the moving of the Holy Spirit, that does not mean Eric's going to get up and start running up and down the aisles. That does not mean he just interrupts the service. It means an empowerment comes over him. Every single time the Lord moves, he's in order. He's in order and under self-control, and we will be as well. We will be as well. Okay, on to the next. Verse 14, verse 14. Then Peter stood up from the 11. Your attention, please. This is our boy Pete, the guy who always puts his foot in his mouth, always says the wrong thing. This is a different Peter. He's now empowered by the Holy Spirit. He's just a different person. He's going to stand up with the 11, raise his voice, and address the crowd. Fellow Jew and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Verse 15, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. Listen to what he says. It's only nine in the morning. Some of your Bibles will say the third hour. He's saying, hey, we're not drunk, guys. In fact, it's 9 a.m., right? So this has nothing to do with inebriation. He's going to say in verse 16, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Your attention, please. I love this. A man after my own heart. That's what we do here at Edgewood. We open up the word of God. And we teach through the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And that's what Peter does. He's going to stand up. He's going to be preaching out of the book of Joel. So let's look at Paul's sermon. Your handout, I think it's going to say the same as before, the three responses of the Holy Spirit. It it should say Peter's sermon. Peter's sermon, okay? It should say Peter's sermon. So let's read it. Verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Again, this is going to be the book of Joel. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Your attention, please, breaking down Peter's sermon. First of all, all mankind. Everybody see that? If you do, say yes. All mankind. Next to that, right, not just Jewish Not just Jewish. What does that mean? This new covenant, this gift of the Spirit is not just exclusively for the Jewish people. It is not for the Jew and the Gentile. It's not just Jewish. It's not exclusive. It's not exclusive to one group of people. That's when you look at your neighbor and say, thank goodness, because if you're not of Jewish descent, you're out. You're out of the party, right? So it's for all people. The next one is going to say the last days. Everybody see those in quotations? The last days. Implies, write this down, the last days began here began here. In other words, there is a keen understanding of these disciples realizing Jesus ascended into into heaven. The Holy Spirit now empowers them. They now have received the Holy Spirit to now do ministry and to move forward. Um, It implies to them, they're making the implication, hey, the end is coming. We're in the last days. We're in the last days. The next one, sons and daughters. Everybody see that? Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters, write this down. Very important. Not just male. Not just male. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit doesn't just come upon men. Paul's going to say in other translations, hey, men of Jerusalem, men of Judea. He's not talking about physical like men or women. He's saying to the men, men of Judea, because the women were not present. They were at home. Think about this. Jesus' ministry was very unique. Jesus had female disciples. Jesus had female, female followers. He empowered these women as well for ministry. Men just don't receive the Holy Spirit. Women do too. It's a brand new different work. It's a brand new thing. And so now men and women now receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as well. Write this down. Or you'll notice on your handout, sorry. Visions and dreams, write this down, a life fulfilled with purpose. A life fulfilled with purpose. So write that down. Visions, visions and dreams. He's going to say, um, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Your attention, please. 
And it's not necessarily what we think it is. It's not necessarily like a vision or a dream. Here's the idea, that each one of us, once we're empowered with the Holy Spirit, we now have the empowerment to fulfill the purpose in our life. That's what that is. You're now filled with the Holy Spirit. You're empowered to now move forward in what God has called you to do. Here's my point in saying this. We all have a purpose in serving the kingdom. We all have a purpose in serving our king and the, and the kingdom. You don't know this. I'm standing there before service, and before every single service, I pray. I pray for you. I pray for me. I pray that the Holy Spirit empowers me. I pray that the Holy Spirit gives me the words to say. Even now, the minute I get up here, I'm praying for you. Whether you're awake or not, I'm praying for you. Know that. Know that. That's not held against you. That's called grace, right? You're awake or not, I'm praying over you. I'm praying over you. That work doesn't stop. We're praying for one another. Years ago, I attended a church, a church called Calvary Chapel. I walked into this church. There's a pastor standing in front of the pulpit, and I'll never forget this. Never forget this. He opens up his Bible, and for the first time in my life, he would say, open your Bible to this book, to this chapter, to this verse. See, I had been to churches, and maybe you have, where it's been like three points in a poem, right? Like Jesus is next to you, Jesus is close to you, Jesus is behind you. Let me finish up with a poem, rah, rah, we're out of here. But I never had anybody really teach me the Bible. And so it wasn't until I experienced that, where he, it was the first time in my life, go to this chapter, go to this verse, and it changed my life. Going through, studying the word, changed my life. And I felt like that knock on my heart saying, Roger, this is what you are to do. This is what you are to do with your life. And can I tell you this? Whether you believe it or understand it or comprehend it, um, I live to do this. I love doing this. I daydream about this. Sometimes on Saturday, Saturday nights, I go through my notes. I got to take melatonin sometimes to put myself to sleep because I'm like, I can't wait to tell them. It's like fire shot up in my bones. I can't wait to tell them. So sometimes I got I to gotta do some things, the tea, the melatonin, to put myself to sleep to kind of calm down my enthusiasm. Here's the point. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. What is the purpose God has placed on your life? What is the calling God has placed in your life? Can I tell you this? When it says... Um, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Your attention, please. That means God is not done with you. You're not too young. You're not too old. You're not too broken. You're not too inexperienced. You can't sit here and say, well, man, I have the boring testimony, Roger. You don't know my story. God does. He'll use it. Well, pastor, you don't know my background. You don't know the things that I can say. God will use it. Give it to the Lord. That's my point. God has called us for a purpose, for a reason, and the Holy Spirit is going to equip us to move forward. Listen to this. Psalm 71, 18. Psalm 71, 18. And now that I am old and gray, don't forsake me. Give me time to tell this new generation and their children too about all your mighty miracles. Your attention, please. You're not too young. You're not too old. What has God called you to do? I believe with all my heart the day will come. God will move me on. Whether it's God will move me to another ministry, maybe I, I, down the road I'm here and I retire and I just physically can't do this, God will give me a vision for the next thing in my life. And I believe God will do the same thing with you as well. God has you for a season, God will call you to serve, and God will empower you with that through the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 19, let's go ahead and we're going to land the plan. We're going to go through these very quickly. Verse 19, I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billions, uh, excuse me, billows of smoke. Verse 20, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Write this down. The implication is this work will continue till Jesus comes back. This will continue till Jesus comes back. We'll continue till Jesus comes back. Jesus talked about in the last days, the second coming, the rapture he talked about, it's gonna be like a pregnant lady, the birth pains that happen. So what happens is there's gonna come a period of, uh, of time where, where she begins to start showing. We all know that she's pregnant. And as it gets closer and closer to her delivery, her, uh, her transactions are more frequent and they become more intense. And Jesus is saying, you'll know it by those birth pains, the, the transact, the, the uh, um, the, you know, the pain will intensify and it'll become harder for, the, for, the, for that individual. And, and may I say this to you? We're in the last days. She's showing and she's shown for a long time. And that's the implication there. We're gonna do this until Jesus comes back. So verse 21, verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Write this down. Method on salvation will be different. Write that down. Method on salvation will be different. What do I mean by that? Old Testament way of thinking 
it was all sacrifice. It was all ritual. It was, they had to do their work. God does his work. Do your work. God does his work. I've heard somebody explain it like this. It's like learning how to play music with sheet. It's sheet music. You're learning music theory and you're playing it. That's the Old Testament. The New Testament, you're learning to play by ear. The music is now in you. It's different. You hear it by ear and you can play it. And so that's the idea that we say. The salvation, the method of salvation is now different. The rituals are gone. The transactions are now gone. The sacrifices are now gone. Jesus has done all the work on your behalf, Christian. You just need to receive it. So the mode of salvation will be different. Verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. As you yourselves know. Write this down in your handout. Peter summarizes Jesus' life. Write that down. Peter summarizes Jesus' life. He's going to summarize the mission of Jesus, the calling of Jesus, the obedience of Jesus. So he's going to summarize Jesus' life. Everybody with me? Verse 23. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Okay? Your attention, please. Where's Paul going with the sermon? He's also saying this. He talks about the death of Jesus. So write that down. He's also talking about the death of Jesus. He's saying he was nailed on the cross by guys like you, by wicked men. And so he's implying their responsibility in that. So he talks about the death of Jesus. Verse 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Write this down in your handout. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so write that down. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus. Your handout, also right there, this is going to be your last blank, so I'll say it to you right now. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. Due to time, I'm not going to pick on that too much. We'll come back to that. But he's going to imply God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, both. He's implying that mystery, the mystery of salvation. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. That's going to be your last one. God's sovereignty, man's responsibility. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so let's do this. Let's land the plan as the worship team comes up. Verse 37. Verse 37. He's going to go on. Peter will go and proclaim. He's going to be quoting scripture from David. He's going to talk about his fellow Israelites. Actually, let me do this. Verse 32. Let's go to verse 32. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we were all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Verse 34, for David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Messiah. Your attention, please, now as we close. What's their response? Peter stands up, preaches the gospel, gives the background. He's declaring now the challenge before them. What's the response? And I love this. Look at their hearts. Look at their hearts being open. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Your attention, please. Yes! That's Pete. That's Peter. That's that same knucklehead just a book ago, right, who denied Jesus three times, and now with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, he stands before this massive crowd, preaches Jesus, and then gives the invitation at the very end. What do they say? They're going to say their hearts are going to be open. What do we do with this? And he's going to say, repent, repent, receive Jesus, turn away from your sin. He will make you brand new. He will gift you with the same Holy Spirit. And folks, that invitation is to us now today in 2020, 2024. Let's pray. And now we'll, we'll land the plane now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you. And God, we thank you for this incredible dynamic chapter, chapter two in the book of Acts. This is really the birth of the church. And so Father, it's really neat. When we read this, we don't see this as a a textbook, as a history book. We are a part of this living organism today. 
the church. And so, Father, we thank you for the birth of the church. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I do pray, would you find us, Father, faithful? Would we be people that also repent of our sin? That we would be sensitive to the things of the Holy Spirit? That we would ask for this on a daily basis. Holy Spirit, equip me, empower me today. Give me your power. Give me your strength. Give me your vision today. Give me your grace. Give me your peace. Give me your eyes to see people through your eyes. In Jesus' name. By the way, before we leave, those of you that are watching online, those of you that are here, you want to pray to receive Christ as Savior. I'm going to, pray for, uh, I'm going to ask you to pray with me and you're headed in your heart. Say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm a sinner. Just like the, the, the Bible says right there, that I would repent of my sin. Father, forgive me. I know, Jesus, that you died on the cross for me. And I know, Jesus, you were raised from the dead. Right now, King Jesus, step out of heaven. Come into my heart. Come into my life to be my God, my Savior, and my friend. I commit to follow you, Lord Jesus, the rest of my life, the best way I know how. Help me to be your disciple. In Jesus' name. If you pray that today, under the sound of my voice here, just a couple of minutes, we're going to close in song. I'm going to be by the double door. Come see me. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to hand you a Bible. I'd love to encourage you and help you in your next steps of faith. Those of you that are watching online, we're so glad you're here. You're not here by accident. Please know that. You're here by divine appointment. If you prayed that today, reach out to us, church office at caelakeland.com, and we will be in touch with you as well. The church, please stand now as we worship the Lord and as, as, we, as we close our time together.